Have you ever thought there is only one way to achieve your goals? Welcome to episode 51 of the Career Discovery Podcast, the show that is all about helping you broaden your career horizons, discover your professional potential and empower your career journey. This week, we're excited to introduce you to Liz, who is an experienced director of economics and policy in the UK's environmental services consultancy sector. Liz shares amazing insights into her area of expertise, her inspiring career journey, and she has tons of valuable advice for us too. We also touch on the themes of self-trust in decision-making, getting diverse perspectives and the power of mentorship. And of course, we also discuss why there's always more than one way to achieve your career goals. So whether you're considering a career in economics, policy or the environmental services sector, or you're simply seeking inspiration for your professional journey, be sure to tune in as Liz has tons of great insights for us. Enjoy the show. Liz, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to the show and thanks so much for being here. No problem at all. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Me too. How about you kick us off by telling us a little bit about who you are, what you do and how long you've been doing it for? Okay, well, there's lots of different storylines that are embedded in how long I've been doing what I'm doing for. But to start <laughs> off, I'm Liz Lewis Reddy. I'm the director of the policy and economics team within ADAS, which is an environmental yeah. and agricultural consultancy. And my work is very varied. So yeah. I do direct work for clients, which can be the public sector, whether that's national government or local government. It can be the private sector across a range of different business types, whether it's the water sector or the power grid and also the private, the third sector, rather the charitable sector, which is where I spent a lot of my working life before joining ADAS. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, Liz, this is a podcast. So I'm wondering if you're somebody who enjoys podcasts or audio books or audio things. Um, so if you are, perhaps you could tell us about what you're enjoying right now. I really do enjoy all things audio. And I think yeah. that podcasts have been a godsend for someone like me who spends a lot of time doing very mundane tasks because the thing I always forget to say when people ask me what I do is that I'm also a farmer. So I have a beef and sheep farm in mid Wales with my husband. Wow. And farming is awesome. You do lots of really, really cool stuff working out in the environment with animals. But at the same time, there's lots of really boring tasks <laughs> that don't take a lot of intellectual <laughs> heavy lifting. So podcasts yeah. and audiobooks come in really, really handy to distract you from the mundanity of the tasks that you have at hand. And I'm a yeah. bit of a BBC fanatic as a Canadian coming yeah. over and discovering the range of audio opportunities there are on the BBC, but especially when the BBC podcasts were launched. So I really yeah. enjoy specifically listening to the Global News podcast. This is going to sound really nerdy. I really like <laughs> podcasts <laughs> like newscasts and even the yeah. Today program podcast because I often don't have time yeah. to sit and listen to a big chunk of news, but I really enjoy yeah. it being digested in a way that's quick and easy for me to understand and touching on topics that are not just relevant to my life, but my job as well. So those yeah. are the sorts of things I listen to. And especially when there's any good dramas on the BBC, mm. any detective dramas that I can listen to and just while away the hours putting in fencing, listening to a good Rebus drama is always very, very mm. handy indeed. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I love the BBC ones. I think one of my favourites um, from the BBC was... The Missing Crypto Queen, which is about... Um, oh, like, yes. Did yeah. you listen to that one? Yeah, so good. I listened good. to that one. I love all of those those particular yeah. sort of crime drama ones. Yeah, definitely. Very, yeah. very good. Yeah. Yeah. And they do really great music documentary ones as well, which I think mm. are really interesting. So looking back at a, yeah. a genre or a band or something. So, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Okay. Liz, there are so many misconceptions about the work we do. So I'm curious about the misconceptions of your work. You know, what do your friends and family outside of the industry think you're doing all day? 
Well, I know my family doesn't know what I do. <laughs> because more often than not, they say to me, can you send us something you've done recently so that I can share it around the family so they can see what you do? We know that you work in the environment and we know that you kind of work in agriculture, but what exactly is it that you do? Yeah. So I said I started my career in the third sector, which was very much about trying to influence change in land management at a yeah. national level so that it was delivering sustainable land management and by that we mean land that is capable of producing food but also a clean water managing flood water carbon sequestration a multifunctional landscape and yeah. a lot of the work in the third sector that I did was about proving that can be done testing that principle on the ground and then it's about yeah. convincing those who make policy that if they develop legislation or specific instruments like agri-environment schemes, or for example, the biodiversity net gain opportunity or nutrient neutrality, then they can actually yeah. incentivize change so that all land management is sustainable rather than necessarily just ones focused around agriculture or other types of land management. And pretty much what I do is I work closely with a client of whatever types that I described at the beginning. They have a specific yeah. question they want answered in that sphere. And yeah. we pull together, my team and I, a proposal as to how we're going to deliver it and help the client come to an answer that they either choose to act upon or sometimes yeah. it can end up being part of a weight of evidence that results in a decision future on or further on down the chain. But Essentially, yeah. I provide evidence-based research for a range of clients. And so it starts off yeah. sounding real and exciting and slowly becomes slightly more desk-based. But I really, really yeah. enjoy what we do because every question from every client is different. And it makes it feel yeah. like you're actually having an impact and causing a change with the work that you do, which is the most important thing to me. That's how I describe <laughs> it. Now, we met one of your colleagues on the podcast a few weeks ago, and she told us all about the, I guess, the, the industry or sector that is soil science. I wonder if you could um, mm. give us the umbrella view and tell us about the um, environmental services sector or industry. Okay. So a lot of the work that we do is at that higher level. Soil science yeah. is part of the evidence that we build upon to provide back to the client. But we also look yeah. at the wider services in the water sector. So how water is cleaner, how water can be managed, yeah. how carbon dioxide can be sequestered, how biodiversity can be enhanced. And yeah. essentially, that's a growing field because we recognize or rather the society recognizes and government as a reflection of society recognizes this as well, that we need yeah. to consider all these different environmental opportunities with everything that we do, whether it's associated with the land or the sea. And in the past, there were certain services that were prioritized above others. So if we think about mm -hmm. farming or the provision of food as one of those services, which it is, yeah. most yeah land management was focused on producing food at its maximum output. And there wasn't necessarily yeah. a huge amount of consideration given to the impact that focusing on that one environmental deliverable would have on all the other ones, would have on the amount of yeah. water, would have on the cleanliness of the water, would have on the biodiversity. And what we're growing to recognize now as more evidence is generated is that if we focus too much on one deliverable, then it actually negatively impacts our capacity to produce that same deliverable into the future. So we need to start thinking yeah. of all of the deliverables that are associated with the way we manage our land and our water. And that's yeah. a lot of the work that we do. We're asked these high level questions by clients. Well, if we want to ensure yeah. that we've got sustainably managed ecosystems, to use another buzzword, then we yeah. have to consider all the different elements that we need to see come out of the action that we do and how we can make sure yeah. that even if we do prioritize one, we're not undermining the ability to deliver others in the future or to continue to deliver the one we want to prioritize. Yeah.
that makes sense. So it's about a balanced approach. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I don't want to get all doom and gloom, but I'm, I am interested <laughs> in, the, in the cost if, if we don't take action. Absolutely. It's, it's one of those things where we're only just now growing to realise the pounds and pence or the dollars and cents impact of the work that we do. And again, that falls back mm. to our history of focusing on one deliverable or one commodity. Yeah. We were only valuing the tonnage of wheat that we could generate per acre or the tonnage of yeah. wheat that we could generate per acre from a particular grazing animal. And what that yeah. meant is we were undermining the delivery of all those others, partially because they weren't having a value put to them. That in itself mm. is a challenging concept because people believe in the intrinsic value of nature and the environment. And what that means is essentially the value in its own right. It doesn't have to have yeah. pounds and pence put on it because it's an intrinsically valuable thing. But unfortunately, if you don't value something in the same way as you value the thing that you're trying to generate, that commodity, you end yeah. up forgetting about those other ones. So a lot of mm. the work that we do is about monetizing the other yeah. services that can be generated alongside that known commodity. And by bringing those values onto a spreadsheet, let's say, all of a sudden they have to be considered as part of the argument. And there's been a lot of work yeah. done in government and by third sector organizations looking at specifically how we can adequately value the impact of what we're doing, the cost of what we're doing on something, and also the benefits if we do it yeah. a little differently and consider all these other yeah. elements. And we are getting better at that. But yeah. part of the challenge is a lot of these valuations, they don't feel real because there's not a market to trade these other services. Mm. And again, there's arguments as to whether any of them should be tradable. But if we start yeah. reflecting these additional deliverables in the same sort of language that we talk about the financial considerations of the commodities we do know have a market, then it just makes it part of the conversation. And even that's a good place to start, because if we don't, yeah. again, they get forgotten about. They become the mm. also ran element of the discussion. And more often than not, that ends up undermining what we want to achieve with our primary focus, but also it undermines future opportunities. And that, I think, yeah. and I understand why that's one of the hardest bit, because we as individuals find it very hard to look into the future. Our yeah. governments change over cycles very short term. So it's yeah. difficult for them to look into the future. But these are the sorts of decisions we start have to start making now. I know with the UN saying we're now in the era of global boiling than the sorts mm. of catastrophic weather events we've seen around the world this summer yeah. only serves to highlight the road that we're currently on if we don't do something to yeah. understand better the impacts that we have, the cost of the actions we take, and the opportunities that would exist if we just did things a little differently. Yeah, and I guess that's why... Um your work is required because it needs it needs that policy level to be able to um, impact such big change. Yes, because you can't expect society on, on its own to do it. You can't expect yeah. the private sector on its own to do it. You can't expect government on its own to do it. The three yeah. have to work together in order to affect yeah. long-term change. And we've seen situations where if government doesn't support the action of the private sector or underpin it with that wider public sector perspective or the public good arguments, you can't necessarily mm. expect a business on its own to forego yeah. opportunities for the good of the public because that's not necessarily yeah. their job. But if you have the public and private yeah. sector working together, then both ends of that spectrum should be covered but ultimately yeah. needs society to act on it as well. So I yeah. definitely don't see it as one of the three 
has to take the lead. It has to be the three working in concert for it to work. And you're absolutely right. A lot of what we do in our jobs is provide evidence to government on how they could make it work with a piece yeah. of legislation or with a specific instrument that could either bring the private sector to the table or meet some of yeah. the needs of society so that you can start demonstrating it working in practice. And that's quite often the key. Yeah. Yeah. And if I if we think about other countries outside of the UK, would they have similar problems where they've prioritised food or other commodities like coffee? Are they having the same discussions with their governments and so on? They definitely have the same issues. Whether they're having the same yeah. discussions with their governments is a different kettle of fish entirely. So yeah. I know that if we take Brazil as an example, we can see the impact that a change of government can have in terms of change of priorities and change of legislation. From one under Bolsonaro, yeah. where it was definitely pro maximizing production from the Amazon rainforest area to yeah. one that was highly protective of the Amazon yeah. rainforest. And that reflects how even just short-term political change can have a significant impact. Yeah. We also see situations like in the Scandinavian countries where they do things subtly different and then they have mm. renewable power generation, which is fulfilling all of their energy requirements. So any of the capital they generate or revenue they generate from their selling of liquid gas means that they can have a community wealth fund and start looking at opportunities yeah. for the society to benefit from that particular asset. So yeah. although I think there is a lot of power in the government sector, they respond to the needs of the people. And it's the people who ultimately elect them into that powerful position. So it's a, yeah. it has to be something that's carefully thought of and actually does yeah. impact the way that we live our lives into the future, short and long term. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing. That's really interesting. Um, so, Liz, tell us what we might find you doing on an average week. Well, unfortunately, lots of teams calls, <laughs> but I think that once, once you're managing a team, as I do, there's a lot of coordination that's involved yeah. in a job like I have. But if I would focus on the projects that I get involved with, it can change on a daily basis, which I really, really enjoy. Yeah. So I can be one day looking at evaluating a national scheme used to support agri-environment measures in one part of the UK. And then the next day I can be looking at a very specific piece of legislation to understand yeah. what governance structures would need to be in place in order to make it work effectively with the landowning community. I do a lot of collaboration with the other members of the ADAS family. So although our yeah. team is described as policy and economics, because that's such yeah. an overarching theme, it means I get yeah. to work with Lizzie's team in the soil yeah. science space. I get to work with those of our team who monitor biodiversity. I get to work with those in our team who are looking at modeling greenhouse gases and the impact that will have on certain yeah. land management and vice versa. So that is a big part of what I do, collaborative action, and not just within ADAS, but within the wider organizations with whom ADAS works, both within the RSK yeah. group of families and external to that. So yeah. there's a lot of talking to people, trying to find consensus and a little bit of doing deliverable at the same time, which I really, really enjoy. Yeah. And it's that deliverable bit which keeps me grounded and helps me continue to understand the area within which I work. And I would struggle to give that up if I was asked yeah. to completely take a collaborative role or one that was involved in managing a team with no delivery. I think that delivery part is fundamental to me enjoying my job and feeling like I'm continuing yeah. to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, um, and I'm just almost picturing the, um, the government relation tip, government relations team from my previous organization which was an asset manager and um, I know that there was a lot of external relations that was happening there so meeting with the policy makers mm. meeting with the government and so on and I'm, I'm almost picturing that's the, those are the kinds of meetings you might be having as well. 
Yes, yes, a lot. We do a lot of work where government comes to us with questions, but we yeah. also support government with the identifications of new ones, <clears throat> excuse me, which I think is in some ways even more gratifying because mm. you often feel when you're in a consultancy position that you're not necessarily given the opportunity to be very creative. You can be yeah. creative in the way that you respond to questions, but that can feel quite limiting if someone mm. else is effectively telling you what they want to know and you have to go yeah. and figure out how to find it. But when yeah. you get to work with the client to help them come up with the questions that you think need answering, that crucial bit at the end of a report where you give recommendations for further research or gaps that need filling or areas that need exploring, that's the part that I really, really enjoy because you feel part yeah. of that creative process. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. And and Liz, that you mentioned that you're in a leadership role. So perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about um, that for people in the audience who might aspire to be leaders one day. It's funny. One doesn't refer to oneself as a leader. That's <laughs> It's always a really challenging thing, even though you may be in a position where you're responsible for guiding what other people do and defining yeah. strategic objectives and helping people achieve their own objectives. It doesn't feel like leadership. It just feels like working with people. Yeah. And I think that working with people is as much a skill as any of the other skills that I have. So learning how to do an evidence review or learning yeah. how to write in a way that's actually understandable for something are quite important yeah. skills. But at the same yeah. time, learning how to support and manage people and help them achieve their goals and help the yeah. business choose a direction that's going to be beneficial for both the objectives of the business and financially sustainable. That kind of yeah. leadership is just as important. And it's yeah. often underrepresented in the sort of work that we do because we and yeah. we are usually technical specialists who then get yes. elevated into a management position. Yeah. But ADAS has put a lot of effort into ensuring that we've got access to training to enable yeah. us to hone that particular management skill, which is always being honed on a daily basis. Yeah. <laughs> and it's <laughs> it's very satisfying, just as yeah. much as the delivery element that I would struggle to let go of. I really yeah. enjoy working with and managing people. That brings me a lot of satisfaction too. Yeah. Well, it's a skill in itself, isn't it? Learning how mm. to deliver through other people. Um, and it is it is one that we have to learn in leadership roles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. OK, so you've told us about what might be happening on an average week. Um, what about the, uh, you know, highlights or things that might happen throughout the year that it might be nice to um, showcase? It's interesting because when I joined a consultancy job, as opposed to one where I was, I would say I was a direct delivery partner, as opposed yeah. to someone who was undertaking pure consultancy. I had expected that there'd be ebbs and flows throughout the year. Yeah. And perhaps those might be guided by the annual budgets that each of our clients have. And so at some yeah. points of the year, there'd be crazy manic activity and other points would yeah. be a bit quieter. But actually... It, over time, it's grown quite steady. So there's yeah. no specific time of the year where you would expect to be working on one type of work and then not yeah. on another. Yes, there's the usual last financial quarter of the year. There's an underspend in the budget of whichever client. And they think, ooh, now's yeah. the opportunity to ask that question <laughs> that I've always wanted answered, which can represent a challenge. But most of the time, our work is quite steady and we will yeah. pick up projects through the year across a range of topics. And again, that's yeah. part of the beauty of working in the consultancy space, especially in that policy sphere that we do, because yeah. more often than not, they are multi-year projects. So you get mm. to see something through the long term. I recently yeah. was very lucky to have been working with a government of the devolved nations where 
they asked me to undertake a bit of evidence review and from that evidence review to do a feasibility study and from that feasibility study to develop an implementation plan and from that implementation plan to then actually deliver it on the ground. And having the opportunity to be part of every step on the process was wonderful because I knew it from the beginning to the point that it was at now. And that's an unusual thing. Normally we only get to do snapshots. But yeah. when you do get to be involved in every step of the chain, that's incredibly fulfilling. And I yeah. also do really enjoy, although again, it's not calendar specific, is now that we're finally an associate member of the Horizon opportunity, the Horizon funding yeah. for Europe, which was great because those are magnificent projects. Mm. We come together as members of Europe And there's academic partners, there's private sector partners, and we explore some really big and interesting questions. And you get to talk to people from all across the continent with whom you would never have had the opportunity to meet and have a discussion about often quite a niche topic, but one that is fundamental and seeing the different cultural and political impacts on that specific topic is really, really fascinating. So I really, really enjoy those sorts of projects. But yes, it's incredibly varied. You can't necessarily know what you're working on one month might be the same a couple of months down the line. But sometimes you do very luckily get to see something go from start to finish. And that's incredibly satisfying. Yeah, that's that's um yeah, I can imagine that would be and I and for anyone who doesn't quite understand what we're talking about, I almost picture it a bit like um in that example you just described, you ran the whole four hundred meters, whereas in another project mm. it might be that someone takes the first leg and then you have someone taking the second leg, a bit like a yep. relay and the, the baton that's is right. passed on. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, there's a bit more chance for reflection on why the hell did they only go that slow? <laughs> but oftentimes it is very much that segment of the relay yeah. that you get to focus on. And yeah. handing it over in as best condition as possible is normally one of your primary objectives. Yeah, great. And again, curious, you mentioned Teams meetings, but are you in the field at all? Um, are there any interesting or bespoke tools that you're using? Tell us a bit about how you do the work. Well, it's interesting because when COVID hit and people talked about moving on to entirely remote working and working yeah. from home, I sadly thought my life hasn't changed at all. <laughs> <laughs> because when I joined the consultancy, I was already home based. Yeah. So my job, the tools of my trade are access to the internet, yes. and, which can be challenging in a rural location, yeah. and a reasonable computer with reasonable hard drive and memory. And then yeah. it's my brain and my colleagues' brains that are the most important bits. So we do a lot of work, which is involving primary research where we work directly with stakeholders. And again, that everyone's moved on to teams now, even working with the farming community, it's actually easier to get a collection of landowners around the desktop or laptop because it's in your own living rooms. You don't have to worry about checking out to a meeting in a local village hall. Although, There is a lot to be said for face-to-face when you're trying to talk through a difficult subject with lots of opposing opinions. So I can see the value in that. But most of what I do is sat in front of a computer. And the software like Teams and Zoom and Skype has changed how interactive my job is from one where I would have to spend four hours in a car to get somewhere to have a meeting for a couple hours and then travel back home to one where I can have a number of meetings in a day with the same people that were in that two hour meeting. But again, there are downsides. There is the fact that you are remote, which means you are remote from other people. And so something we've instituted in our team because we're spread all over the UK is that we come together as human beings in one geographical location once a quarter. 
And as oh, I say, you good. get to see the backs of people's heads, <laughs> which is absolutely <laughs> fundamental. And their legs. To getting to know people. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And below their shoulders to actually know they're human beings. So, yes, yeah. we we make sure we do that because that interaction is quite important to maintaining the cohesion yeah. of the team, but also to maintain your interest in the work that you do and yeah. your ability to work for and with the other members of your team. So yeah. I, I'm sad to say that the main tools of my trade are my laptop and the internet and yeah. the brains of myself and my team. But yeah. we rely heavily on others who do go out in the field and gather yeah. that primary data, as we call it, whether it's the soil condition for a particular yeah. analysis or whether it's gathering data from working with people's perspectives and different stakeholders. And then we we have a number of statistical packages and yeah. quantitative and qualitative analysis software packages that help us analyze the data. But yeah. most of it is very desk based. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, before we move on to what you love about your role, Liz, I'm curious about your team. Does everybody within your team do the same kind of work as um, you without the leadership or are there different almost spokes of work within your team? Spokes of work within my team is probably a good way of put it. We normally describe it as pillars, but spokes yeah. is probably better because we do interact a lot more. We're not just siloed yeah. capabilities. So within our team, we have people who are more about the numbers. That's what, how I yeah. would describe them. They might not like that description, but they're the economists, the people yeah. who do a lot of the quantitative data crunching. And we yeah. have social scientists who yeah. do a lot of the qualitative data. So speaking to people, gathering opinions and perspectives and gather some yeah. numbers, but it's much more about perceptions and yeah. opinions necessarily than numbers. And yeah. we also have members of the team who are a bit more like me. I'm less of a technical specialist and more of a generalist. Yeah. So yeah. I'm the person who helps bring that bigger picture together across all the strands of our work that we do. And that's why, yeah. for example, when I talked earlier about undertaking an evaluation of a big government scheme, is that within yeah. that you will have to gather up all the numbers on how much money was spent on this, that, yeah. and the other, and how much money wasn't spent and the cost benefit associated with that. And then you'll have yeah. to speak to the stakeholders who are actually benefiting from that scheme and what it meant to them and the sort of changes they anticipated and what actually did happen. And you have to bring that all together in a big report at the end to explain this is what the scheme's objectives were. Did it achieve against its objectives or not? If not, why? Did it spend yeah. the money it expected to spend? And what were the extra things that nobody anticipated would happen, either good or bad, that actually yeah. either supported or undermined the delivery of that scheme? Because I almost call it that's the reflection part of the job we do. We can sometimes help design things that then get implemented. But a really important and interesting part of what we do is when something's finished, we get to look back to see how well it went and then help to design it better in the future. So yeah. because of all those skill sets across the team, we're able to present that combined whole, again, relying on the data provided by people like Lizzie and by others in the field who are giving us that really crucial data to underpin the outcomes that we need to measure against. Yeah, I think that that's um, a really nice um, f um, description or, or visualization rather that you've conjured up there because I think sometimes when we hear a role, we can have a certain perception about what that role is when we quite frankly know nothing about it. But you've just showed mm. us there that there's room in your team for people who are great at numbers, people who are great mm. at communicating with other people, great at pulling it all together in, you know, in the report writing phase. And and I think that that almost goes to show the beauty of a, a a great team doesn't it it's that mosaic of strengths yeah. and skills it isn't just one one job one skill absolutely and it's something 
I initially struggled with when yeah. I started my career in consultancy because I've always been a generalist. I've not someone who's understood the minutiae of a single specific topic. I've always been yeah. someone, a big picture always sounds a bit grander than it is, but I've been someone who steps back from things and sees yeah. the bigger picture, <laughs> for want of yeah. a better phrase. And there's just as much room for those people in a consultancy which has a huge amount of technical specialists yeah. because ultimately one doesn't want things to be siloed. We don't want a team to be working over here just on that and a team to be working. We want yeah. them to be able to come together and produce a coherent something. And that's yeah. where generalists are so important because they understand yeah. enough of a little bit of what everybody yeah. does so they can bring it together and present it as a combined whole. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, Liz, tell us what you love about your role. <laughs> well, I think I said at the beginning that making a difference was a big part about what makes yeah. me happy as an employee. And I really enjoy the fact that I get to work very closely and on behalf of the people who are making the decisions that will affect my life and the lives of my community and potentially the lives yeah. of future generations yeah. and being able to provide them with robust evidence to underpin a statement. So if, for example, people want to affect a change where, like post-Brexit, where all of a sudden we are going to change the way that we support land management across the UK. Yeah then we want to make sure it's right. We want to make sure that we're doing that. And that's very, very hard. And one might say that we're not going to achieve it, but you get to be part of the puzzle, part of yeah. the group of people who are pulling together the evidence to say, this is what we could do if we did it absolutely right. It doesn't always work out in the end, but you know that you answered questions that really need yeah. answering and potentially made a real change. And that's that to me is what I really love about the job. I also, yeah. alongside that, really enjoy the people I work with because they're all incredibly committed. They really enjoy the work they do and they just create an environment that's pleasurable to be part of. So yeah. I think that I couldn't have one without the other. If I felt yeah. like I was making a difference, but it was a really, really miserable environment, <laughs> I probably wouldn't be able to stick it. And I wouldn't yeah. be able to stick it if it was really enjoyable, but yet I didn't feel like I was making a difference. So those yeah. two together make it pretty good. Yeah, great. What about the challenges of the work, Liz? I think for me, the biggest challenge is that I, of course, am a person with my own perspectives and viewpoints and yeah. opinions. And that's not necessarily what people are asking for. They may want, yeah. because I have worked in a specific area for a certain period of time, they may say, okay, Liz, you've seen a fair bit of this. Give us your opinion on what you think works. But that's not the same as my opinion on things or my perspective on the world. So having to step back and just focus on the evidence yeah. and provide insights that are driven by the evidence rather than my own personal opinion can be very, very challenging, especially yeah. if I fundamentally disagree with some of the findings from a yeah. philosophical perspective, even mm. if from a evidence-based perspective, that's what they're saying. So I can find that very challenging. But again, that's why the recommendations for future research <laughs> is such a yeah. fundamental <laughs> part of the puzzle. Because yeah. I remember when I was doing my PhD, and you spend so much time gathering data, analyzing data, comparing it to previous evidence, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And my thesis supervisor said to me, that last chapter where you talk about the future, that's yours. That's where you mm. get to say, this is what mm. I think based on yeah. all this. And I feel the same about that element of the work that we do is that Obviously, I can't be opinionated or philosophically driven. It has to be based on evidence. But if I yeah. can generate robust argument based on the work that we did and based on my previous knowledge, then it gives us the opportunity, not just me, but everyone who writes that last section, yeah. to put a piece of themselves into mm. the work that they're doing to demonstrate that 
as human beings, the experience and expertise we have is just as valuable as the weight of evidence that we might be bringing to the table. So that's a real challenge, but it's also something I really enjoy as well. Yeah. Oh, great. And Liz, if you look back at the work you've been doing, um, what what's something you're really proud of that you can share with us? Hmm, that one's an interesting one because often you don't feel like you own things. Often mm. you're part of a team, which yeah. can generate a lot of pride in and of itself, but it doesn't necessarily yeah. feel like yours. Yeah. So I think probably the piece of work that I'm most proud of is the one that I referred to where I ran every stretch of that 400 meter race that you referred to because I and I team, I should say, ran every stretch of that race, but I got to be involved in it. And that's unusual and feels so Mm -hmm. magical because you get to see something from start to finish and get to see how it ebbs and flows. The hardest bit of that will be letting it go at the end. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which we all have to do to hand over that baton. But I got to hold yeah. on to it for a fair chunk of time. And I really, yeah. I really enjoy pieces of work where you are given the freedom to drive its direction. So it's not yeah. just a matter of this is something I want to know. Tell me the answer. You're working with yeah. a client for a certain length of time. They grow to trust you and respect you and you trust and respect them. And so that they can say, okay, Liz, What's the next step? That's yeah. a really, really good feeling. And then you know that you've earned the opportunity to have your voice heard as part of that evidence base is quite magical. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, we're coming up to 50 guests on the podcast so far. And um, I, I think there's some common themes um, about this kind of what people love and what people are most proud of um question these questions and and it does tend to be i i felt that i was able to add value i had a voice Mm. i was able to have an impact and it just goes to show that you know whatever work we're doing if you can find something where you can have an impact add value in whatever way is right for you then that it's really satisfying yeah Yeah. it is having a voice that people hear and listen to and maybe even act upon is wonderful. Yeah. And having a seat at the table of those who are making decisions is really important. And it's a position that needs to be respected by the people yeah. around the table, but yourself as well. It's an opportunity that not everybody has. And working in the consultancy sphere really does give you that seat at the table and being able to use it to its maximum effect is really, really, it's a good feeling. Yeah. All right. Liz, let's go all the way back to the beginning. When you were at school, okay. what did you want what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, well, I I was one of those sad kids who always knew what they wanted to be. And it wasn't surprisingly a consultant. It was <laughs> I wanted to be a vet. I wanted yeah. to be a vet from as young as I knew what a vet was. Yeah. And in Canada, there are only three vet schools. Mm -hmm. And there's across the whole of the nation and and they're very regionalized. So the kids on the East coast go to the East coast one, the kids on the West coast and so on. And I ended up, I read all the James Harriet books. I wanted to be a large animal vet and hopefully if I was lucky enough being a wild large animal vet. So someone who goes out and works with moose and things like that. Anyway, long story short, (laughs) I came over to the UK to go to vet school. Yeah. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But as an international student, the tuition fees, I saw myself graduating with this massive student debt and having to return to Canada, paying off a student debt. And the only thing that would make money as a vet in Canada would be small animal veterinary medicine. And Mm -hmm. as much as I love my dogs and cats, I've got far too many of them. I didn't want to be someone who just spayed Fifi yeah. and Frufu all day. <laughs> I wanted to be a large animal vet. So yeah. I went back and did my master's and in yeah. behavioral ecology, so the study of animal behavior in their environment. And yeah. then as luck would have it, when I had been in the UK, I met a Welsh farmer. And so we got together 
And I came back to the UK and did yeah. my PhD, this time looking at the interaction of the farmed animal, so sheep with their landscape, and how I yeah. could create as an environment whereby you could have food production alongside delivery of biodiversity, delivery of clean water, soil health. Yeah. So that's when my life started to pivot towards mm. veterinary medicine, towards one that's much more looking at that balance that we talked about at the beginning, the multifunctional yeah. landscape. So I still, as a farmer, get to do all the things that James Harriet did in his books. Yeah. I don't necessarily understand them as well as if I was a vet, <laughs> but that's a fundamental part of what makes me happy as a human is having that hands-on interaction with the environment, with the animals that I care for. But at the yeah. same time, that really helps to inform my day job, which is one very much about generating the evidence base for a multifunctional landscape. So you can kind of see how the threads of what I wanted to do pivoted but yeah. kind of stayed on the same track so if I were to have said to my eight-year-old self that you're one day going to be living in the UK and yeah. providing evidence for policy for government they probably would have found it incredibly boring <laughs> <laughs> but I find it incredibly rewarding so as far as I'm yeah. concerned it's all worked out all right in the end <laughs> and you're looking after large animals on the farm Exactly. Exactly. As I said, that's, I think, to be frank, the fact that my job is so desk based, that I sit mm. in front of a computer, if I didn't have another half of my life that was very physical, yeah. that was very outdoors, I would really struggle with that. So I know, yeah. We've put a lot of effort in our team to make sure people have the space to go out for walks, to make sure they're interacting in a physical way with the world as much as at the remote way, because that's so important to our mental health and well-being. Yeah. And I definitely rely on the farm for that particular yeah. string to my bow. And it gives me that practical experience that's really important in the job I do, too. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so. At what age were you when you relocated from Canada to the UK to come to vet school here? Early twenties, I think twenty-one. Yeah, yeah. And um, and and how how far into vet school did you get before you realised? I'm not sure about you know the the the, the cost here because it's a seven year it's a seven year course, isn't it? If I remember rightly. It's five year, but then you okay. obviously have a couple of years where you're actually working as not a fully fledged vet. Yeah. But the the thing was back in Canada, in order to do veterinary medicine, it's yeah. a doctorate, whereas here it's a bachelor of veterinary medicine. So I already right. had my undergraduate degree when I came yeah. over here. So I'd already spent four years in academia, which is why I was 21 when I started with a number yeah. of 17 and eight year olds. <laughs> Yeah. In the UK system, which is a cultural shock in and of itself. So, yes, it was after that first year when I went back home and I just looked at the finances. And as much yeah. as I loved the course, I knew that had I known I was going to be living and working in the UK, the yeah. risk matrix, as it were, or the costs and the pros and cons columns might have been slightly different. But at the time, yeah. I saw myself returning to Canada and I yeah. just knew that that debt would be too much for what I wanted to do. So I had always had in my mind that if I couldn't do veterinary, then I wanted to pursue academia in the yeah. field of animals in their environment. So I had that to pivot to, which is what I ended up doing. And luckily, yeah. what I've ended up with is somewhere a bit of a halfway house between the two, yeah. as you already said. I still get to play with large animals. I yeah. don't recommend marriage as a way to maintain your career. <laughs> but I would, I would say that the work that I do, I get to look at all that as well. So I really, really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. And what was your undergraduate degree in? It was in what we called honours biology. So when you did a thesis as part of your undergraduate in Canada, it's a four-year programme. 
So yeah. you have your first three years, which are very course driven, and your last year, yeah. which is a combination of courses and thesis writing. So very similar to the one here. The only difference yeah. being that when you want to go on to do a PhD, which was my other potential backstop if I didn't get into yeah. veterinary medicine, was to do a PhD in Canada, you had to have your master's. You can't jump straight from a bachelor to a PhD. Yeah. So I always knew that I would have to do my master's. So yeah. I have spent far too long at various <laughs> universities. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, I've only attended two graduation ceremonies, though. But it was, I really, really loved working in academia because it gave yeah. you that focus of looking at a specific area and that you were there to learn. And I have to say that that's something that's carried over to the job as a consultant. You get to learn all the time because you're reading yeah. papers, you're finding out what the latest research and evidence is. You're actually undertaking primary research occasionally in the field or with stakeholders. And you're constantly building that evidence base that you've got in your head. So it's a lot yeah. like being at university, but with the added yeah. benefit that you actually get paid. <laughs> yeah yeah which is quite important yeah so yes yeah. very and was your PhD in yes. Canada no yeah, it was great. over here I came back here and did my PhD and that's when I started pivoting more towards the agriculturally managed landscape than necessarily the wilderness landscape that I'd anticipated I remember yeah. when I was doing my master's presentation um, because back home you had to do a viva for your master's just as your yeah. PhD and I had originally worked on bats. And it's because I had, I knew that I wanted to work in the field of animal behavior and the yeah. environment. And sometimes you just have to find an opportunity with a random species as opposed <laughs> to find the ideal species that you want to work with. And so yeah. I had to catch these bats and I had to tag them and watch their behavior and gather data. And then it's obviously very hard to catch bats. So during my presentation at the end, I said, I really enjoyed the opportunity to work with bats, but now I'm going to do my PhD on sheep. And everyone just started laughing because they're a completely contrast species. But it was just an indication of how I was slowly moving up through the trophic levels of animals to get to where yeah. I wanted to be, which was, as yeah. you said, the large animals in the environment. Oh, interesting. So I'm just going to kind of summarize. So under a graduate yep. degree in Canada, over to the UK yep. for first year of vet school, back to Canada for the master's and then back to the yep. UK for the PhD. So lots of I transatlantic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I think the number of trees that we've planted on the farm have probably somewhat balanced my carbon footprint, <laughs> but not entirely. So, yeah. But actually, I think what's really nice is there, um, even though you weren't able to, I guess, follow your passion um, right through to the end in your field of work, you were able to fulfill that passion through the farming, which is your, I guess, mm. I, I know it's still work, but in, you know, in non-work mm. life. And I think that's really important, yeah. isn't it? Because some people have a passion that unfortunately might not pay the bills, but actually that passion is just as valid. And if you can keep that going alongside your day job, then that's going to make you a happier and more fulfilled and rounded person. It, you know, our passions don't always have to be through the job. There are other ways. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And if you're lucky enough to have a job that inspires you, then that's amazing. And yeah, it doesn't have to be what you're passionate about either. You can be inspired yeah. about things that aren't your passion, but just give you a will to do a good job. But having something which fulfills that end of that particular part of your brain that is what really inspires you to get up in the morning, then absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. that's what makes me think I'm a well-rounded human being, but whether or not I actually am, that's for others to decide. <laughs> But yes, I would have to say I completely agree. Having a passion that's outside your work can be just as important, if not more so sometimes. Yeah, great. So what happened after your PhD? Well, that's when I went into working for the third sector. And that's where right. I started my work career of delivering these sustainable land management and proving that it can work 
on the ground. And then that's yeah. what gave me that experience and background to then start taking that into the policy sphere and have the job that I have today. So yeah, it's quite a logical trajectory that I followed, mm. but I would never yeah. have been able to see the end point if anyone had asked me at any point along the road of where I was going to end up, which is good, yeah. I guess, in some ways. Yeah. And the third sector, just for clarification, is that the charity nonprofit sector? Yes, exactly. So the environmental yeah. non-governmental organizations. So things like the Wildlife Trust, RSPB, National Trust. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I think that what you just said there is really interesting that you wouldn't have been necessarily been able to see the end point. And I think that actually that can often um, cripple some people, can't it? Um, from starting, mm. you know, I, I, I can't see, um, I can't see the, the destination point. So I'm going to, I won't start until I can see it. But actually, I sometimes yeah. think about it. It's a bit like a staircase, isn't it? You climb one stair, and then um, the next stair or a couple of stairs appear, and then you choose which one, and then the next one yeah. appear. So you might not be able to see the top of the staircase, but if you keep taking steps, more steps will appear. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, whether it's a corridor with a number of doors or whether it's climbing a mountain in a mountain range and seeing the next one just over the horizon when you get to the top. Yeah. It's it's more about making the decisions that seem right for you in the moment rather than yeah. worrying about whether they're the right decision for the long term, because you will get there. You will follow yeah. a path that will get you to a point that actually is probably where you're meant to be, which is really where I feel I am at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So how long were you working in the third sector for and what did that work look like? I worked for a wildlife trust from, let's see, 2006 to 2018. So how many? Yeah. You can see how I'm not the numbers person. Yeah. On this. <laughs> so a reasonable chunk of time. <laughs> and that was very different from yeah. the job I do now. There were certain similarities. I found working in the charitable sphere, it was a very familial environment it was a very yeah. supportive environment it was an excellent place for me to start my career because i had yeah. all these lofty ambitions from being in academia far too long and it's only when you hit the real world with a bump that you realize mm. that everything you learn in the library or from books needs to be tested in practice in yeah. the real world and the third sector very much operates in that call face that real world environment where you actually have to take the learning that you've spent so much time on and do something with it and it allowed me to develop as a person in terms yeah. of my work ethic in terms of my communication skills in terms of my ability to work within a team and also yeah. To then start to see how some of my ideas and what I'd learned and the work that I did was actually growing into something bigger, which I then yeah. wanted to share with more and with others in a way that felt like it was more impactful. And that's when yeah. the opportunity to join consultancy came. And I yeah. sometimes yeah. do things in consultancy that are completely different from anything that I've worked on before, but mm. I've got that bedrock of knowing how to use my skills, which helps me on that path. And also working with a huge range of incredibly talented and intelligent people helps to make that job easier too. But yeah. yes, I really, really enjoyed my time with the third sector. And it was only just because I reached that point where I felt I wanted to make more of a difference that I yeah. decided to make a change. Yeah. And in that organization, were you also in the, the social policy economic type teams? Well, I was very much in the conservation team. So one could yeah. say that it was social policy because it yeah. was all about conserving the landscape, but ensuring that people were part of that process of conservation. So it wasn't yeah. conservation without the people bit. 
And yeah. I think that's something which has been quite fundamental to the work that I do going forward, which is that we can't affect any change without bringing our communities with us. And so having that ability to bring people along on the journey is really, really yeah. important. So, yes, yeah. I would say, although I didn't just wouldn't have described it as social policy back then, it definitely yeah. has a strong social element to it. Less so the economics, because, again, as just demonstrated, numbers weren't necessarily my strong <laughs> point. But that's why I've got really good economists in the team who do those sorts of jobs. <laughs> OK, I'm seeing your gorgeous dog in the background. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Oh, dogs are welcome. Yes, one of the. <laughs> it's as long as the cat doesn't walk across the screen. That's always the most <laughs> off-putting in a in a Zoom or Teams call. <laughs> oh, okay. So, does that bring us where we are today, or are there any um, other steps on a lot along your journey with Adas that you want to call out? Um, I think that. When I joined ADAS, I joined as a senior consultant. So I came in yeah. with my background in the third sector and the skills that I had from my Tiananmen academia. And then as I grew within my role within ADAS, I was given the opportunity to take on leadership of the team that I was part of. And yeah. again, that was an opportunity that I wasn't sure I was ready for. You were talking about people need to sometimes see the end of the point that they want to get to or feel that they're 100 percent ready yeah. and i think it's something women in particular struggle with which is the imposter yeah. syndrome and feeling that they have to know everything 110 percent before they can even start that journey but i yeah. felt when i was offered the opportunity that if i didn't take this would the opportunity arise again and if it did, yeah. would it arise in time when I wanted yeah. it to? So yeah. there was never going to be an ideal time. And I knew that this was something I ultimately wanted. Whether or not I was ready for it at that moment, I felt yeah. I just had to have faith in myself and take it. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I couldn't, I couldn't have made it to where we are now still doing the job if it weren't for the yeah. really awesome team of people that I work with both around and above me. So that's been yeah. fundamental. So having a good team network that you can rely on is really important. But that's what I would say is don't worry about not being ready. Just be yeah. brave enough to take that first step. Yeah. And I think when it comes to opportunities that have been presented to you um whether that's we'd love you to do this role or we'd love you to apply for this role mm. you know the people who are saying that to you they believe in you so even if you're not mm. quite ready to believe in yourself yet you know they wouldn't have said yeah. that to you if they didn't think you were ready absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah absolutely <laughs> Okay. All right. So Liz, when you look back on your career journey so far, um, talk to us about, um, talk to us about, I don't know, perhaps any challenges or failures or limiting beliefs that you've had to overcome. I think it's probably part of my background, but I came from a family where you were expected to do well. There was no it's not as though you weren't congratulated or told yeah. good job when you did a good job, but yeah. you were probably pointed at more when you didn't do well than when you did. So you'd get very few plaudits when you did well, but you'd get mm -hmm. really pointed at when something hadn't worked. <laughs> so yeah. I think that shaped what who I was as a human being and what yeah. I expect from myself. And I'm probably my harshest of critic. So if I think badly of what I've done, nobody else mm. is going to think as harshly as I do because that's who I am as a human being. And I have to recognize that. And I know one of the challenges I faced is when I always loved school, whether it was elementary, junior high, high school, university, I always loved school. Yeah. And I saw every year as an opportunity to do better than I did the year before. But that yeah. didn't always work out. <laughs> yeah. And there were some times that I really, really struggled with a course 
or yeah. I didn't achieve the grade I needed to. And I knew that when I, for example, was finishing my undergraduate and because it was so highly competitive to get into vet school in Canada, I knew I didn't yeah. have the grades to get in. Yeah. And that's what made me apply for an international opportunity because even though that yeah. too was highly competitive it was a different pool and yeah. I managed to get in and yeah. I was absolutely overjoyed but then I had to make that really challenging decision of mm. not continuing that path because I could see the potential burdens associated yeah. in the future and that was a really really hard decision but before I made that decision I made sure I knew what the other opportunities were. So I wasn't yeah. just making a decision to not continue with vet school and then have nothing. I had my plan of what yeah. the other route was and I knew where I was going, when that would start. And so I had that to look forward to because I like being able to look forward to things, being able to yeah. know that there's something happening in the future that I can rely on. So I found that to be a very challenging time, having to step back from something I'd wanted to be for such a long time and work so hard for yeah. to a slight pivot. But having that plan mm -hmm. and that pathway really helped me settle. And the same when I came over here and left Canada and my family to shift into a new culture and a new country, yeah. I struggled at that point. Yeah. But again, I had my PhD, which I could focus on. I had my husband and the farm on which I was working. And you start to carve out the environment that suits you and the person you are. So yeah. I've had a number of different challenges, which have ended up sort of pushing me in the route that I've ended up. But all along that, I've had that sense that I'm not doing as well as I should or I'm not achieving mm. as much as I should. And that whole issue of comparing yourself to others, whereby, yeah. ooh, look how well they're doing and look at me, yeah. I haven't quite done that. And I think it's very easy to be self-critical and very yeah. easy to doubt yourself. And that I find is part of the role of having a really strong network of people around you, whether they're people you work with or your friends, and they help to be that external validation and support for you. So when you're yeah. doubting yourself, they'll say, come on, Liz, you've done this before. Or what are you talking about? You did a great job there. And you thought, oh, so yeah, let yourself put yourself out to the side sometimes and just take the warmth of the people around you to be that support you need, because that's quite fundamental to you overcoming those nagging self-doubts. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that I think that. Um... I think sometimes we are our own worst critic, aren't we? And mm -hmm. and actually, it's just remembering that when you're having a tough day and, and trying to give yourself some grace and some compassion and and yeah. looking back um, on the times, um, you know, all the situations where you have done this before and done well, because it will probably yeah. be okay again. And yeah, but it is very yeah. tough, and I think that in it, in that, in the extreme of that, it can lead to things like burnout and things, which is why it's so yeah. I think just important yeah. to be, you know, if you are somebody that has that tendency, be aware of it and um, and try and talk yep. to people, like you say, because it sometimes just needs another person to say, "Hey, come on, you know, you, this is great." Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Asking for feedback. From the right people <laughs> yeah, yeah. is really, really important because your own feedback is going to be the worst you're going to get. So yeah. nobody else is going to touch it as bad as what you would give yourself. So be brave enough to ask the people you trust their opinion on how you did and they will give you the truthful response. And that's the one yeah. you should listen to more so than someone whose opinion you don't trust and more so than sometimes yourself. Because we are all yeah. very self-critical. Yeah. And for anybody out there who is facing a big decision, like you faced when you decided to head back to the Canada after vet school, or or somebody who is facing um, a challenge, you know, what what would you recommend they they do to help them with that change or decision? 
like you said, talking to people is quite important and talking to a range of people. So we can mm. we can be at risk of being in our own echo chambers. I know we've heard that a lot with regards to political persuasions, but yeah. it impacts exactly the same thing when personal circumstances we can be surrounded by people who will tell us the same thing or tell us what we want to hear so we have to yeah. make sure that we're brave enough to ask a range of voices their perspectives and opinions and you don't have to follow them yeah you can choose which path to follow but at least it gives you that range of options because it can feel sometimes when you're in a challenging situation that your options are limited that yeah. that step on the staircase leads off into a chasm or all the doors in that corridor are shut yeah. but just talking to a range of people can just lift that weight and then ultimately yeah. you have to make the decision but as i said with me I tended not to make a decision where it was either a binary decision of one or zero. I yeah. had a plan associated with either of those, which meant that when yeah. I stepped off one staircase, I was on another. I wasn't just stepping yeah. into the abyss. And although that yeah. can't always work, timing doesn't always work, but it makes it so much easier to make a challenging yeah. decision when you know what the pathway is that you're stepping onto. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, I guess that leads me very nicely into my next question, which is around role models and mentors and sponsors. What impact have they had Excellent. on you? <laughs> <laughs> um. When I was younger, very little, because I was yeah. one of those people or one of those kids who always knew their own mind. And I didn't, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew mm -hmm. how I, what I needed to do to get there. So I suppose when I remember when I was a kid walking past a, I don't know, a personality contest and they were asking people what their, their role model was in terms of who they yeah. would aspire to be. And I always said, Dr. Doolittle, that's who I was, <laughs> which is obviously ridiculous. <laughs> but I very much had that concept of that's who I wanted to be. And yeah. that has represented both a challenge and an opportunity for me. Not the Dr. Doolittle bit, but the fact that yeah. I'm one of those people who always wants, oh, look at what that person doing. I'm a bit of a magpie. So I'll go, oh, that yeah. looks very cool. That's what I want to do. And, oh, that looks very cool. And so that can pull you forward, but that can also yeah. make you feel as though you're never achieving if you don't match exactly what they've done. And so yeah. that's something that I've had to balance over time. Mm. In terms of role models and sponsors, what I found when I was working in for the charitable sector and as I'm working in my current job is there are yeah. people whom I really respect and whose opinions really matter to me because I respect mm. who they are as people and the work they do. And I am quite lucky to have been able to have people I work with and people in my wider community who yeah. are very happy to have those conversations with me about what it is, what is it you want to achieve, Liz? What's your yeah. next step? What's your next yeah. ambition? And those sorts of penetrating conversations, trying to understand, help me choose that next path has been really important yeah. to me. So Dr. Doolittle's now in the background, but <laughs> real people with perspectives that are useful and important are the ones yeah. that I now go to, not necessarily to whom I want to aspire to be, but can help yeah. me come to decisions about what my next steps are. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really helpful to have those people because they, they can almost challenge you to ask the questions that you're not perhaps ready to ask yourself yet. And, and, yeah. you know, most people do want to move forward. They do want to progress. They don't want to stand still, but it, it, yeah. it, it is helpful to talk to a range of people to kind of get some ideas on, or even just get to get your own kind of mind thinking about, um, yeah, where, where do I want to go next? What could that look like? What are my options? So I um well, exactly. I agree. It's really important I, to have I know those people. I had, absolutely. 
I hadn't even thought about the consultancy sphere as an option for me when I was working yeah. for the third sector. But a woman who I worked with who came from that environment, she said, oh, would you consider this sort of job? And I thought, yeah, maybe I would. And yeah. so just having those conversations <laughs> is really, really important to helping you understand what route might be possible for you. So I know that you reach a point in your career where people will come to you and say, would you consider an opportunity this? And you might think, no, no, I couldn't possibly do that. But it's always worth having yeah. that discussion because you don't know, yeah. as you said earlier, you don't know what that job entails. And it may be that yeah. you actually have all the skills. You've just never put them together in that way. So keep your yeah. options open is what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Okay. So for anybody thinking that they might like to, um, to find out more about a job in social policy or economics in the invent environmental services sphere what what uh, what would you recommend they think about from an education training um sp perspective well there are very few academic careers that aren't relevant to the work that we do yeah because the key skills are you need to be able to communicate well, and that's yeah. across a range of spectrums. So the way you write, the way you speak, the way you analyze data, and you need to be able to feel comfortable communicating complex messages in a simple way, a simple yeah. and straightforward way. So those are sort of the basic tenets of what we do. And academia yeah. of all stripes teaches you the skills of how to analyze data, how to manage big complex chunks of information, whether it's reading a whole bunch of novels for review or whether it's undertaking laboratory research. There's very little that you can yeah. do in academia that wouldn't prepare you with the building blocks for consultancy. And even yeah. within our team, even though we work in an agricultural and environmental consultancy, a number of members of our team don't have that background. But that's because yeah. the work that we do relies less on the sector specific knowledge and more yeah. on the analytical skills required. So if you're interested in policy, you don't have to do a job in, or an academic career in public policy. You yeah. just need to be able to do the things I've described, analyze large sets of data, complex pictures into simple and straightforward messaging. And yeah. it may be there's a whole range of consultancies out there that don't just look at agriculture and the environment, specifically look at public policy. And I would highly yeah. recommend something that was very common back home and which is happening a lot here and what we do within our team is a number of universities offer you the student placement year or a graduate mm. placement where you can go and work in the field as it were for a year yeah. and then come back for your final year of your degree it does make that degree a little longer it does mean you step away from academia and then come back when potentially some of your friends might have already graduated but yeah. we as a team have really enjoyed having students within our team who learn to hone the skills that we described and get a feel for the sorts of work that we do and the sorts of areas that we feed into. And I find yeah. that really valuable, both as people contributing to students' growth, but also the students themselves learning to figure out what exactly it is they want to do. So there's a whole range yeah. of opportunities in that space. And I would really encourage anyone to take up those opportunities if the university offer them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great point, actually. And I think sometimes when I'm, I'm almost picturing myself back at uni now, so long time ago, but um, <laughs> the course I did, the course I did was a three year, a three year course and there was no sandwich year. But actually, and actually, if somebody had said to me, do you want to extend the course for another year? I probably would have said no, because I was worried about money or something. Mm. But actually, I, I felt like I sort of landed on the other side of my course with no plan. And actually, I think had I done a sandwich year, I think that would have really benefited me. So all, even though it would have taken me an extra year, I, I think it would have accelerated my growth beyond university quicker. And actually, one yeah. of um, 
one of the girls on my course, even though it was a three year course without a sandwich year, she she actually went to the university and paused her studies, went and did a, a placement year and then came back a year later to do her third year. So the reason I say that is because if somebody's listening to this thinking, actually, I think her placement year would be really valuable for me, even though your course isn't a placement year course it might be that your university can accommodate something like that so it's just mm-hmm. worth having the conversation absolutely and in terms of the concern about finances as an example i know our student placements are paid a wage a full-time wage yeah so there are yeah. some student fees that might be required depending upon what course you're in but you do have the opportunity to earn and i know our most recent student placement before this current year he actually got to be primary author on a report to government as a technically third year student. And imagine the track record that gives you and the opportunities to point to something like that. So a good student placement can be really, really beneficial, not only for your career, but also for your final year of university, because then your, your thoughts have started to coalesce around what exactly it is that you want to do, what inspires you as a person. Yeah. And it makes it so much easier to commit that time to finishing yeah. off on a high. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so we've talked about the, um, I guess, the technical skills. Um, what about, um, what what would you say, what soft skills would you say are really important for somebody thinking that this work might be for them? Well, it probably sounds a bit trite because everyone probably says it, but being able to listen is really mm. important because yeah. oftentimes when you're working in a very technical field, the communication be, can be one way. So someone asks your opinion on a question and you give your opinion and that's it. But yeah. what they asked you might not be what you thought they asked you. And so being able to listen and interact with the client or people yeah. in general is a really fundamental part of what we do. Because as I've said a number of times through this conversation, we work as part of a team. It's very rare that we deliver a project all on our own. So being able to work well with others, work well with clients or people who are paying you to do the work is really, really important. So people skills are quite fundamental. Active listening, proactive conversation skills are really important. And as I said, yeah. the communication skills, that being able to coalesce complex arguments into something simple and straightforward is really, really important. It's too easy to write a piece of work using lots of words that have many syllables in them that look very compl- yeah. complicated, but actually end up saying nothing. It's important that everything yeah. you do says something. And that's really, really yeah. a fundamental part of the work we do. Yeah. Um, Any other soft skills you want to call out? You know, it's really hard, the soft skills side of things, because being remote workers, Mm. you lose a lot of that interaction Mm. because I no longer have to worry about whether I'm maintaining eye contact with someone or (laughs) those kinds of things. It's really, really hard. But being someone who engages well with people and because we're remote yeah. I put a lot of effort into reaching out to people as humans yeah throughout the day so yeah as a director of a team this may not apply to every single role within the team but as someone who manages a team it's really important that you take the time to make sure you're keeping in touch with the people who you're responsible for managing because not only to make sure they're comfortable with the work they're doing, they feel they have everything they need, they understand what it is that's being asked of them, but also just to make sure that you're in touch with them as people. So that people interaction is quite fundamental to what we do. And because ultimately all of our work is about hearing from people, feeding back to people, and then giving people more opportunities, That's really, really fundamental that you're able to do those things. Yeah, thank you. What does the future hold for this space? 
for my job area or for me? <laughs> for your for your job area. For my job area. So <laughs> as we've seen through the news, as we talked about earlier this evening about yeah. the catastrophic weather events, it's become more and more important that the way policy is made at a local, national and international government level actually means something. I remember yeah. a piece of work that I did looked at how and whether or not this is still true. There's apparently a rule in Switzerland called the Tinbergen Principle, whereby okay. no piece of policy doesn't have an associated delivery mechanism. So when politicians are making grand plans and statements, <laughs> alongside that, they must have a vehicle for delivery. And yeah. I think that's becoming more and more important. As we are entering a period where we are seeing actually existential threats to certain parts of the world, people living in certain parts of the world. Yeah. We can feel quite comfortable where we are, and yet we still have dramatic weather events like the heat waves we experienced yeah. and the impact that has on our environment and our ability to produce food for ourselves and others. And yeah. we need to have policy that has that instrument sitting alongside it to deliver. And it may not always work as well as it should, but that's the yeah. role of the work that people and I do to see how well it's worked, to refine it and then make it better. But it's fundamental that that instrument sits alongside that overarching objective. So that's where I would yeah. see the future of this space, less the grand yeah. lofty principles and more the how mm. are we going to do this in reality? Because that's what ultimately really matters. And to be truthful, yeah. that's the bit I really love is testing that instrument to make sure it works. Yeah. So that's what I would say the future of the work that we do should be. Yeah. Hopefully we'll yeah. get there. Yeah. Yeah. And if somebody would like to find out more about this area as a potential um, career for themselves, where would you point them? It's a challenge. If you want, if you want to look at government as to being at the call face on the policy design and being actually the one who's making these decisions based on the evidence that people like I am involved with, then I would say the government websites tend to have lots of really good links to opportunities yeah. to work with them, but also the sorts of careers and backgrounds that they would like people to have from an academic perspective in order to get involved with them. I know we did a piece of yeah. work for the FSA, where they specifically pointed you at the Food Standards Agency. They pointed mm. you at the types of degrees and career pathways that would be really useful to follow. But again, as I yeah. said, you can get into it from a range of different spheres. Yeah. They're always looking for bright, intelligent people to come and join their teams. So I would definitely yeah. point people at the government websites for that. In terms yeah. of the consultancy space, so the people who generate the evidence for government, then again, there's a whole raft of different consultancies in all the different specter sectors across the UK and internationally. Yeah. And they are always advertising for people who can join at a graduate placement level or a consultant yeah. level to start growing into the people who will become yeah. the seniors and the directors in the future. So I would yeah. definitely recommend keeping your eyes open for those sorts of things, because okay. I know we routinely advertise on all the yeah. various um, job platforms that there are. Yeah. Is there a, uh, a, a professional body or membership organization for environmental services it does something like that exist there certainly is there certainly is so there's yeah. c-i-e-e-m then they this okay. is when it's much more in the environmental services sphere as you said so the people yeah. who would potentially going out and working in the field and yeah. then coming home and translating that into a report yeah 
So there's organizations like that. And obviously, if you're a specific area within consultancy, like soil science or agricultural yeah. economics or environmental economics or social scientists, there's lots of different membership organizations yeah. associated with the different branches of the consultancy sphere yeah. that you'd like to be involved with. Again, that's yeah. the problem with my being a generalist and not a specialist, is that I'm not necessarily signed up to any <laughs> specialist organizations because I sit across a whole range of them. But I would yeah. recommend you join those sorts of organizations in the fields yeah. that you're interested in because they can help point you in the direction of opportunities that best suit you. Yeah, perfect. Liz, what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you were just starting out on your career journey or academic journey? Yeah. It'll be worth it. <laughs> I think that's what I would want to tell my yeah. younger self. As much as I loved school, as we call mm. it back home, and uni, as you guys call it yeah. here, I did find it really challenging to think about, well, what is at the end of the tunnel? Yeah. And you will, it is all useful. All the skills that you're learning will be very useful for you when you emerge into the field of work. And if you stay in academia, that's wonderful. If you choose to come out of academia like I did, then your skills will be just as valuable to the third yeah. sector, the private sector and the public sector. So there's nothing that you're learning that is a waste of time because even just the act yeah. of learning itself is something that will serve you in good stead as you go forward in your career. And I don't regret any of the hundreds of thousands of hours I spent on my academic <laughs> career because that's part of what made me who I am and taught me yeah. how to learn in the way that it has. Yeah. And what would you say to young Liz who was dreaming about being a, a vet for the big animals? There are lots of ways to get there. You don't have just one path. I think that's what I would say, because I was very, very focused on one one career path. And I often many times, if I didn't achieve exactly what I needed to follow that path, I was very, very disappointed in myself. Yeah. But as you've pointed out, I got to where I needed to get to in the end. Yeah. So there's lots of different paths. There's not only one way to get from A to B. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Liz, do you have any favorite quotes that you'd like to share with the audience? I think there's only one and I'm going to mash it up <laughs> <laughs> because I always do. And I think this speaks to the importance of the people bit in all the work that we do, whether we work in the environmental sector, sector, whether we work in the agricultural sector, it's people that ultimately matter because yeah. there was one, oh, I'm going to mash it up. I always do. And it was <laughs> something along the lines of, if you show people something, they'll look at it. If you talk to people about something, they'll hear it. If you teach people about it, they'll understand. And it's through that understanding they grow to love. And I yeah. think education is so important and about yeah. everything and bringing people along on the journey, teaching them about yeah. the things that are important. And that's what will affect change. And I think yeah. I forget who it was Baba. I'm going to mess that up so I won't go any further. <laughs> it's a really important quote that I thought just yeah. underpins the importance of bringing people on the journey with you. Yeah, I I will look it up and make sure it's credited properly, but I've definitely heard that <laughs> before. And it's and it's yeah. and it is so true, isn't it? And actually mm. I was listening to a podcast the other day and and they were they were saying um that Sometimes when you ask kids what they've done at school, they, you know, they oh, I can't remember, <laughs> I don't want to talk about it or whatever. Yeah. But if you ask them, what did you learn today that you could teach me? Then they feel a sense of empowerment and they want to share what they've learned. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's similar to what you're saying, isn't it? It's, you know, they've learned something and now they can share it. And, and that's how change is made. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We all teach each other. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Liz, final question. What is your secret to happiness and fulfillment at work? <laughs> if I knew that, <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would say the interlopers in my conversation are probably some <laughs> of my big secrets to happiness. I love being surrounded by my animals. They are yeah. ultimately what kicked me off when I was eight years old. And they are certainly... I think I actually credited my one of my cats in my master's thesis acknowledgements <laughs> because they bring me such sense of relief and joy. But realistically, it's that the job I do impacts the world in which I live and the environment yeah. in which I have my other job. And being yeah. able to join those dots is what really brings me a sense of fulfillment. Yeah. Thank you. So, Liz... Thank you so much for joining us today. I've really, really enjoyed the conversation. And I'm wondering if there's anything Me you want to share with the audience before we go. I hope they've enjoyed listening to my story and I've really enjoyed the opportunity to talk about it with you. You've asked me some really challenging questions that I hadn't really thought about myself. And I am very happy if anybody wanted to reach out or wanted to ask me questions on anything that we've discussed this evening. I'd be very happy to hear from anybody. Oh, that's really kind. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you so much for joining Liz and I today. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you gained any value out of today's episode, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to share with a friend or two. And if you have any questions, comments or suggestions, do get in touch with us. We love hearing from you. Until next week, reflect on what Liz shared with us today. And if you're craving more insights and inspiration, be sure to check out the back catalogue. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a fantastic week, whatever you're doing.